Happy Easter again, church. Today is the second Sunday of Easter in the church. The Easter season continues for 50 days, so we can continue to greet one another with Happy Easter or with those words, Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. Amen. Unfortunately, though, Matthew doesn't give us 50 days worth of Easter stories. Uh, in Matthew's Gospel, there are no stories about disciples walking the road to Emmaus. There's no one gathered in an upper room. There's no doubting Thomas. There's no Peter by the lake shore. You have to go to Luke and John for all of those resurrection stories. We do know that from Matthew's Gospel, Mary and Mary, who we read about last week, they must have kept their courage up and given their report to the other disciples, the ones who were in hiding. And those guys must have believed the women because all of them went to Galilee just as Jesus told them. And that's right where Matthew picks up the story today. In Matthew, we jump right from the empty tomb up to that mountaintop in Galilee where Jesus is about to give his very last sermon. I sat down to write this week, I thought, oh, what can I possibly say about the last sermon of Jesus? Is it, can't Jesus' words stand on their own? And I think they can, of course. It's a short sermon. It's only about 60 words long in English, even less in Greek. It's so short that many people who are frequent churchgoers could probably recite the whole thing from memory. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Okay, I'm going to do more than that. <laughs> Jesus could do it in 60 words. I'll need a few more. That little sermon, that little 60-word sermon, is part of the regular baptism liturgy in many, many Christian traditions, not just the Presbyterian Church. I used those words last week, standing at the font, as we baptized three people into the community of faith. If anything, this little sermon might be overly familiar, something we know, words that are familiar, but that we don't really think much about. I don't think it's often misunderstood, really, but if there's a way that maybe you could say that that sermon has been misunderstood, I think it might be the overemphasis on the word go. Go, therefore, and make disciples. This sermon often gets called the Great Commission, and it's frequently associated with missionaries and mission work. Any of you know it in that context, the Great Commission? What do you think of when you think of a missionary? I thought, as I thought about you all this week, about the folks who first went from Switzerland to Cameroon in the 1880s to plant reformed churches and hospitals and start schools. I thought about the men and women who took up residence in Thai refugee camps in the 1970s, late 1970s to minister to Cambodians who were fleeing from genocide in their own country. I thought this week about John Eliot, who came from Old England to New England, where he baptized and taught the native peoples of this region. Does that more or less sound like what you think of when you think of a missionary? Yeah? In all of those cases, a missionary is someone who leaves their home who leaves what is familiar and comfortable, maybe who even leaves behind their family to go to a foreign land and share the good news of Jesus with foreign people. And despite the complicated nature of Western mission work, I'm grateful for those people, and I bet some of you are too. For some of you, they are the reason that you have come to know Jesus. At various moments in my life, I have thought maybe I would like to be one of them. I bet most of us, though, don't think of ourselves as missionaries in this way. And so it might be easy for us to think that the Great Commission, that last sermon of Jesus, is not for me. It's for those other people who want to go to another country and teach 
about Jesus. That would be too bad, wouldn't it? It would be too bad if the last sermon that Jesus ever preached was just for a few elite disciples who had the will and the courage and the support to leave everything familiar and set off for a foreign land. Thankfully, that last sermon of Jesus, I don't think, it's not just for an elite few. It's not just for some. It's for all of Jesus' disciples, those who are adventurous and those who are homebodies. It's for those who are fearful and for those who are joyful. Remember last week we saw that Mary and Mary had both fear and joy at the same time. That last sermon, it's for those who have great faith and it's for those who doubt. The inclusion of doubters in this story is one of the things I love the most. Did you catch that at the beginning? They all worshipped Jesus, but some of them doubted. You don't have to be 100% certain about Jesus in order to worship him. And you don't have to be 100% certain about your faith in order to be commissioned by Jesus to share it. The Great Commission is for everyone. So let's clear something up about this word, go, in Jesus' last sermon. In English, we translate it just like that, go. It comes across as an imperative, as if Jesus is pointing to each disciple and saying, you, go, go, go. The same way he said to Abraham, well, way back in Genesis chapter 12, go from your father's house and your kindred. But in Greek, actually, this word in Matthew 28, go, we're doing it all wrong. It's not an imperative. Jesus isn't saying go. It's more like we might understand Jesus to say, as you are going, as you are going along, as you are going, make disciples. The command in this sentence is not to go somewhere far away. The command is make disciples. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. As you are going along, therefore, make disciples of all nations. This is not a call for an elite few Christians to move to a faraway country and preach the gospel. This is a command for all of us to be about the work of discipling all kinds of others, even as we are going about our daily living. And so what about this command to make disciples or to disciple? What is it we're being asked to do exactly? When we're talking in church, we usually think of the word disciple as a noun, not a verb. And for most of us, we think of a disciple as a follower of Jesus, the way our children said today. We think of those first 12 or maybe a larger group of people who, who knew Jesus, or maybe even we think about ourselves as disciples of Jesus. Outside of the religious context, though, a disciple really is just a student. When we think of a student in our culture, we think of a person who sits behind a desk and takes notes from a lecturer, or someone who studies for an exam, or who has to learn or memorize some body of knowledge. You all get that. Education is really valued among the families who gather here at Elliott. But in Jesus' day, a student was a little bit less like a classroom learner, and more like an apprentice. In those days, the apprentice, to learn some trade, might actually move into the house of a master craftsman and live with that person and learn the trade by following and doing everything that the master did. A disciple is like an apprentice. And those 11 who gathered on the mountaintop in Galilee, they've already been discipled by Jesus for three years. For three years they have been living with Jesus, following him around all over Israel, learning his trade. And now their season of apprenticeship is up. Now the master of all masters, 
The one with all authority in heaven and on earth is giving them the role of discipling others. They are commanded, commissioned to invite others, all kinds of others, from every ethnic group around the world, to live with them and to learn from them what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And I think Jesus is retaining still his authority. He's not saying, you're the master now. But that all of them together are learning what it means to follow the one, the master of all masters, the one with all authority in heaven and on earth. Now at Elliot, I think the every nation piece of this commission has become part of who we are. And we're thankful for that. We celebrate that. It's still a challenge for so many churches who wish to be more diverse but struggle and find themselves mostly ethnically homogenous. We feel proud of the work we have done to become multicultural, a place where people from different cultures and continents and nations can worship and serve Jesus together. So for us, that might not be the challenge of this call, the every nation part. For us, the challenge, I think, is to reflect on what it means to be a church that invites others into the fullness of our life together, and in that life together, to learn about what it means to follow Jesus. Just last weekend at our session meeting, the elders of the church we talked about the difference between friendliness and inclusion. And I think that relates to Jesus' command to make disciples, to apprentice people. It's relatively easy to be a friendly community, a community that smiles and laughs and greets newcomers. I think it's much more difficult to be a community that consciously and deliberately makes room for newcomers, that helps them find their way into the community life, that listens to their ideas and their opinions, that seeks their friendship, and that shows them the way of Jesus. Too often, making disciples has been translated into making newcomers be like us, believe like us, sing like us, make decisions like us, etc. But because we're not the master, and because authority rests with Jesus and not with us, making disciples means that we are learning together how to live out the command to love God with all of our being and to love our neighbors as ourselves. And folks, if you've ever lived with anybody, you know that living together is messy work. It is messy work for college students who have to live with a roommate for the first time and they realize that not everybody thinks the same way about how clean to keep the apartment or how to share food or how what kind of music is best for studying. Anybody remember those days with your first roommate? How hard it was to learn to live together? Living together, it's messy for married folks who love each other but who juggle competing responsibilities and priorities for careers and family responsibility and household chores and sometimes find that communication and intimacy are difficult in the midst of living together. Anybody ever been there? Find it hard to live even with the person you love the most? <laughs> we both know it's true. <laughs> for older adults who maybe have to move back in with their children or move into some kind of assisted living situation where even though there's people around, they feel lonely or isolated or helpless. How many of you maybe have felt that way too? We're not all there yet, but yeah, we know something about living together that life is messy, it's complicated. It's even messy and complicated for well-intentioned church folk who each have our own ideas about what the church is and how it should work. And it's doubly difficult when you invite new people into the mix. Maybe they expose our bad habits or they question the way we do things. That's true in our households and it's true in our faith community. We take seriously Jesus' call 
call and command to disciple all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Trinity and teaching them to obey Jesus' command, then we have to ask ourselves, how will we welcome newcomers fully into our life together as a community of faith? Our job is not done when that baptismal font lid is closed. It is not enough to smile and to shake hands during the passing of the peace. Of course, does not mean that anything goes. Of course, there are standards for how we live our life together. But it does mean that those who are becoming disciples of Jesus experience in this place more than just a surface level friendliness. We who are longtime disciples must make deliberate, intentional efforts to listen to people's stories, to invite them into our lives, to ask them to share their ideas and to pay attention to what they offer. This is not just my job as the pastor of Elliott Church. In fact, if I'm the only one doing it, We've got a problem. It's not only the job of the elders and the deacons, though they are called to special roles. The Great Commission tells us that this intentional inclusion of newcomers into the community life is the job of every disciple of Jesus. You do not have to go anywhere at all to answer this call. You don't have to be in a good place. Your own faith doesn't even have to be firm. Every one of you is called to make disciples, to share your life with those who desire to be part of the Jesus movement on earth. So I know that you will be friendly when you see someone new here today or next week or the week after that. But my challenge to you is to go beyond friendliness. Remember what it feels like to be new or inexperienced or an outsider. Remember what it feels like to enter into life and community with another person and how messy and confusing that can be. Most of you, not all of you, most of you are insiders in this place. So take a risk. You're already the insider. Take a risk and have a meaningful conversation with someone who is new to you. And that someone might be someone who's actually been here a long time. But you sit on opposite sides of the sanctuary and you socialize in different circles. Take a risk and have a meaningful conversation, even if you don't speak with the same accent. If someone looks lost or confused or lonely, sit with them. Help them find their way through the service or their way through the building. Share your phone number or maybe send a friend request on Facebook. Invite someone to join your choir or your Bible study or to share a meal with you. None of these things themselves are the things that make disciples. We have to do, there's, another, there's some more steps in the process. But there's no other way to disciple someone than to be in real relationship, to share our lives with one another. That's what Jesus asks us to do in the Great Commission. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. As you are going along, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And remember, I, the Master, am still with you and will be with you, even until the end of the age. Jesus' last sermon. And it is not just for a favored few. It is a call for every follower of Jesus to welcome new disciples into our common life, to make space for them, to teach them the way of Jesus. And as we do, I think that we will all find we continue to learn what it means to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love our neighbors as ourselves. May it be so, Elliot Church. Amen. Amen.